kind of a paper by the time Tony um, kind of started organizing all of this. So um, we're gonna see, we're excited to get your feedback. So let's see how I can make this work. All right, so what's kind of the problem that we're uh, uh, addressing in this paper? Well, if you kind of think about um, asset pricing in general, of course, we know that no arbitrage tells us that assets that share similar characteristics should also have similar prices, ultimately. Um, and that generally holds, but if you look at kind of in the short run, um, shock, like large shocks can drive wedges into the, between the prices of similar assets. Um, and this is something that has been documented, of course, in the literature. There are kind of two effects at play when large shocks hit assets. And by large shocks, I'm, I'm really thinking about kind of idiosyncratic shocks, not kind of systematic shocks. So on the one hand, investors may extrapolate from these large, large shocks that similar assets are also affected by similar shocks and therefore may kind of trade in ways that also affect, affect their asset prices. So this is kind of a contagion channel that would posit that if one, one asset gets hit by a shock, that the asset prices of peer assets should move in the same direction. Um, on the other hand, if um, investors, uh, investors may also kind of flee towards peer assets that have similar characteristics but are not perceived to have been hit by the shock. And in this case, asset prices should move in opposite directions. So this is kind of a competition effect that has also been documented in the literature. And what's important about these kind of effects is that they're purely information-based. So it's new information that's released in the markets and investors kind of process that information um, and then act either according to one channel or the other. And if you look at kind of the literature, there's evidence of both competition and, com and contagion effects in many different asset classes uh, and, and that for many different kinds of shocks. So for example, for stocks, we have evidence of contagion in, uh, when um, firms hire from the same kind of talent pool, they, they would expect, you expect to see in the data, and you see that in the data, that their asset prices can move. Um, there's evidence that if, uh, say, one firm uh, issues dividends, wh whether that's good or bad news for kind of similar firms, and there you see also evidence of contagion, there's kind of competition effects among kind of M&A activity. Um, so how do stocks of uh, peer assets react to M&A activity that affects one of the peers? In terms of the uh, bond pricing, um, there's papers that argue that um, when you observe defaults in one industry, that kind of firms in that industry may also experience higher default risk. But then on the other hand, there's new papers that argue that it really depends on the kind of default, the bankruptcy uh, uh, that the, the, the default kind of is associated with. So you can find both evidence of contagion and competition in these kind of settings. So the main takeaway here is that um, whether or not you observe kind of uh, contagion effect depends on kind of what firms you look at, what kind of linkages you think of. And, 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 and generally, one of the bigger problems that you have to face when you're looking at competition and contagion effects in kind of these markets is that the firms that issue bonds and stocks often are, uh, share with each other many different types of business relationships. So there's basically n almost no pair of firms that are just exclusively peers. Almost all firms have either some sort of strategic partnerships, they have uh, credit relationships with each other, they may share common suppliers. So there's many kind of alternative linkages that may be driving kind of these effects that we observe in the data. Um, so what we try to do is we try to kind of think about how can we really understand competition and contagion effects among peer assets without being exposed to kind of these confounding effects that arise because of uh, potentially alternative linkages between assets. And um, what we do is we, we look at kind of cryptocurrency markets. Now, cryptocurrency markets, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies are, if you want to think about any kind of assets, are really truly peers, like there's no customer supplier relationships in cryptocurrency markets. There's no credit relationships in cryptocurrency markets. Um, there are basically no real contractual relationships between these different cryptocurrency peers. So if two cryptocurrencies share similar characteristics, they're really viewed, they're, they can be really perceived as being truly peers. And in addition, cryptocurrency markets recently have become very liquid. Um, and very responsive to information. So there's a lot of kind of trades and a lot of liquidity in these markets that allows us to really kind of test how investors uh, process information about peer assets. 
Now, one of the things that we have to do in order to be able to do this is we have to find a way to identify which cryptos are peers and which cryptos are not. Um, and there's been a lot of like new papers kind of thinking about uh, factor models in cryptocurrency markets and which factors should be used or shouldn't be used. Uh, we kind of don't want to do it that way. We don't want to think about cryptocurrencies necessarily as just crypto uh, assets that have similar betas according to certain factors. The way we're going to do this is we're going to think about cryptocurrency markets if they're co-mentioned in the news. Now, um, I'm going to show you later on evidence that this is actually a good way of establishing cryptocurrency peers. Generally, when the news mentions cryptocurrencies in the same piece of news, they tend to be cryptocurrencies that share similar characteristics. So this way of thinking about peers is, is at least supported by the data. But if kind of you believe uh, the, the way we're going to establish these links, and we're going to do a lot of robustness in assessing whether this makes sense, then the key result that we find is that the competition effect really outweighs the contagion effect, regardless of how you break down this data. So what we have here, and what I'm going to do in the paper, is we're going to think about uh, events um, that uh, affect certain set of cryptos. And then we're going to think about uh, if these cryptos are shocked, how are they commensioned with other cryptos in the news? And how do the prices of those commensioned cryptos move in the week where this shock is observed? And what we find consistently for many different types of shocks is what is kind of showcased in this picture is that the assets that experience the shock move in one way and the assets that are co-mentioned in the news with these uh, uh, shock cryptos move in the opposite way. I'm gonna show you evidence that this is kind of uh, both statistically and, and economically significant. So here in this figure, I have kind of one type of shock. So we think about what happens when some of these cryptocurrencies experience large idiosyncratic return shocks um, or negative idiosyncratic return shocks. And you see that these negative idiosyncratic return shocks in crypto markets are huge and they're kind of like minus 15% weekly. Um, but these assets that are connected with these uh, shocked assets experience a positive idiosyncratic return of about one and a half percent. Now this may seem small, it's about, it's about one tenth of the effect of the shock cryptos, but this is gonna be really economically important as I'm gonna show you later on. Because uh, what happens is that investors really have a hard time kind of processing that this information is really not information about fundamentals of these linked cryptos. So it takes kind of investors a long time to kind of digest this information. And if you start kind of building trading strategies based on these kind of insights, then those trading strategies have a lot of predictive power. So if you just really built a very simple strategy that in the week of an event, uh, where this linked cryptos basically experience these abnormally high returns and you short sell those cryptos and you hold that position open, that simple trading strategy has uh, an alpha of about 55% with basically zero beta and a sharp ratio of 2%. So this is kind of showing you that investors really, it, they, it takes them time to, to process kind of this information that even though these are peers, the information that was released was really not about kind of any fundamental factor driving uh, the linked cryptos. So um, I'm gonna show you some evidence that this is really not due to any sort of implicit linkages that these cryptocurrencies may share. So these are not because the shocks are kind of systematic in a way, the, the, the results are not driven because the shocks are informative about an industry versus another industry. And these are not shocks due to kind of like demand uh, characteristics of certain investors. So there's some papers that argue that um, cryptos in, that operate kind of in the same industry share um, similar asset prices or cryptos that are co-listed in, in the same exchanges also share similar asset prices. And we find that these kind of explanations don't really uh, drive away our results. So overall, what, what we have here is that what we find is that if you were really able to look at a market where there's pure peer effects without any kind of alternative linkages, then in those markets, you will tend to find that the competition effect outweighs the contagion effect. Um, uh, so I think it's, uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the related literature. I think a lot of people generally, I'm gonna say just two things. A lot of people think always about contagion as kind of like contagion, like what we experienced during the financial crisis where basically Lehman defaulted and the whole market collapsed. So the kind of, this is kind of like, a, contagion has kind of been used for that kind of type uh, of effects as well. What I'm thinking about is kind of a contagion effect that goes back way before the financial crisis of really just like 
shocks, uh, the response of pure acids to shocks that are in a way purely idiosyncratic. Um, kind of the Lehman default was of course kind of a more systematic, systemic even kind of shock. And therefore, of course, all these acids uh, co-moved at the same time. I really want to think of is about kind of the reaction of acids to more localized shocks and not kind of uh, system-wide shocks. Um, and in terms of kind of the new literature on cryptocurrency markets, what our results suggest at least is that cryptocurrencies behave in many ways similarly to stocks. So these kind of persistence of these effects are also things that we've observed for stock markets and uh, that kind of at least uh, provides maybe a, a few new insights in how we think about cryptocurrencies. So how are we gonna do the analysis? Well, we're gonna use cryptocurrency data and if you guys have worked on, with cryptocurrencies, you probably know that it's very difficult to deal with cryptocurrency data. It's very messy. There's not kind of like one go-to provider. So what we do is we collect data from three different cryptocurrency uh, providers. One of these is going to be CryptoCompare, which is kind of like one of the more popular sites on cryptocurrencies. Um, CryptoCompare is a really nice site because it collects a lot of like online news. So it has like a repository of a bunch of like uh, uh, news data. Then um, we're gonna use Coin API, which is another very popular site that has information at the exchange level. So it tells you when cryptos were traded where and when did they start trading and, and it, at the exchange level, all the information that you need to know. And then ultimately, even though Coin API and CryptoCompare are probably the most popular sites, um, they have very unreliable pricing data. So if you look at kind of the pricing data for these cryptos on these sites, they're full of errors. Like it's, it's completely messed up. They're often quoted in different units. So it's very hard to kind of deal with the data. Uh, so what we do there is we use uh, a provider called CoinGecko. CoinGecko is kind of like an open source provider. So people, <laughs> there are incentives for people to correct mistakes that they notice in the data. Uh, so that's kind of a good uh, site to use for market pricing data. Uh, we're going to focus only on the largest 100 cryptocurrencies by market cap, uh, even though there are about 3,000 cryptocurrencies that are traded uh, on these different exchanges. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, the sample that we're going to have is relatively short. It starts in October 2017 and it goes through the end of 2019. Um, that's primarily because before uh, 2017, we don't have a lot of like news, news data. Um, on crypto compare, so we just uh, go through there. But overall, what we capture is kind of a really wide cross section of cryptocurrencies. Um, the 100 cent cryptocurrencies that we capture uh, cover about 95% of the total market cap in the market. So, of course, Bitcoin is included in this. Bitcoin is about 80% of the market cap, um, and these other 99 make up about 20%. But what we don't capture tend to be tends to be fairly small. So we feel comfortable just doing this. Uh, we've done analysis kind of extending to like the largest 200 or 250 cryptocurrencies and there's not much differences. Um, what is interesting is that even among these largest cryptos, um, these cryptos tend to be extremely heterogeneous. So they're cryptocurrencies that have volatilities that are fairly small, like 5% uh, weekly, but then there are cryptocurrencies that have 34% weekly volatility. So these is huge kind of, uh, these, this discrepancy is huge. So when we're doing our analysis and we're gonna make comparisons across cryptocurrencies, we have to make sure that we kind of measure everything in the same units. So most of the, res all of the results that I'm gonna show you, uh, or most of the results, are going to be based on kind of standardized versions of these measures, where we standardize kind of, uh, on a rolling basis with the prior 60 day mean and volatility. Uh, so that way everything is gonna be kind of measured in the same way. Um, we built a market index for um, the cryptocurrencies in our sample. Um, and uh, we use this market index to compute uh, market betas. So this beta is going to be the only characteristic that we're really going to use uh, in a way to forecast returns or to explain returns. And then we're going to measure based on this kind of CAPEM model, kind of idiosyncratic returns and volatilities as kind of the residuals of the CAPEM model. Again, here you see that there's a lot of kind of uh, heterogeneity. Um, there are uh, Bitcoin, of course, is the market mover, so it has very small idiosyncratic volatilities. Uh, but then other cryptocurrencies have huge idiosyncratic volatilities. So again, if we want to kind of make a comparison here, we have to make sure to standardize everything. 
Um, so we are going to use kind of this methodology that I developed with, my, with Frank um, to identify when cryptocurrencies are mentioned in news data. Um, this is kind of a three-step NLP based approach where we um, uh, exploit uh, different kind of NLP tools. I am not gonna go into the details of this. Ultimately, what the methodology does is that it tells you in which sentence of a news article is a cryptocurrency mentioned. And then we are going to establish a link between cryptocurrencies whenever they're co-mentioned in the same sentence of an article. We've done in our previous paper, we did a bunch of analysis as to whether this is an okay way of defining linkages. And we find that um, if you wanna define kind of linkages based on like mentions in the same paragraph or mentions in the same article, about 80% uh, about of the important information is captured already with our approach. So there's not really, um, we don't think that there's a lot that we're missing out on just by focusing on these intra-sentence kind of linkages. Um, we use the data from uh, CryptoCompare. So these are news articles published on a, an array of different uh, sites. Yahoo Finance, Bitcoin.com, Coindesk, The Blog, and many other sites. There are about 150,000 articles on a daily basis that we collect. And we apply the methodology then to identify uh, where these cryptos are mentioned. Again, there's a lot of heterogeneity and kind of how frequently these cryptos are mentioned. We find in our, I don't have that in here in the slides, but in the paper, we find that um, the, these kind of online news are more likely to report about bigger cryptocurrencies that are of course well established. So that's kind of uh, to be expected. We have similar results for, for, for stocks. Uh, this is kind of the network that you would extract from these data. Um, so it's uh, a bit small, but um, generally what you tend to see is that this network is something that Asimoglu would call like a star architecture. So you have a core of strongly interconnected cryptos that are surrounded by smaller cryptos on the periphery. Um, the core is made up of the biggest cryptocurrencies. So we have Bitcoin, um, Binance coin, Ethereum, Ripple, uh, so these are cryptos that are generally more frequently mentioned. I'm sorry, the way this is plotted is the size of a node is proportional to the logarithm of the number of times that crypto is mentioned in the news. And the width of a link is proportional to the number, the logarithm of the number of times that um, that link is observed in the news. So if something is in the center, then it's mentioned more frequently. And if something is more strongly connected, then that link is mentioned more frequently. Um, we don't really exploit kind of the architecture of this network too much. We just kind of showcase that this is how the data looks like. Um, and generally there is going to be a bias towards bigger cryptos. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what that implies for our results in a little bit. Now, this is kind of the step that we take that may be arbitrary in a way is that we say, we're going to say that cryptocurrencies are peers whenever they're co-mentioned in the news. Um, now, in order to validate that this is a good approach, what we do is we run logic regressions of whether um, we observe a link between two cryptos at one point of time in our sample. Um, so we're gonna have zero one indicators for all these different pairs, and we have about 650 unique pairs among the cryptocurrencies that are connected. And then we're gonna regress kind of these indicators or the probability that this indicator is one on characteristics of the cryptocurrencies characteristics of the pair that we have and kind of differences in the characteristics between the two cryptocurrencies. So now what would we expect, of course, is that if, a crypt, if two cryptos are very big and very popular, that link is gonna be mentioned more frequently. So that's not necessarily something that would be surprising, but what would be surprising is that if the probability of observing a link is higher, if the characteristics of the two cryptos are similar. So if uh, that's kind of what it's going to tell us whether or not these linkages that we have are really kind of peer linkages. And then in the data, what we find is exactly what I told you. Well, the news is biased towards kind of bigger and more established cryptocurrencies. But what we do find is that the probability of observing a link between two cryptos, even controlling for their individual characteristics for crypto fixed effects and for whether or not these are Bitcoin, Ethereum, whether these links these cryptos are in the same industry or in the same exchange, the probability is higher if the two cryptos have similar ages, similar market caps, and similar betas. So again, this is pointing towards uh, something like the news is more likely to report about a link between two cryptos if they're similar. 
Now, if you believe that cryptos with similar market caps and similar betas and similar ages tend to be peers, then at least that would validate our approach that these indeed <coughs> are cryptos that tend to be peers. All right. So once we have the network of peers here, what we want to see is over the in the time series, when do one of these cryptos experience kind of an adverse event? And how do the cryptos that are connected with that one shot crypto react to this ad adverse event? So for this, we have to kind of identify, uh, define what a shock is. Now, the way we're going to do this is we're going to look at kind of um, over the whole time series and over the cross section, what is kind of, what are the deciles of, um, okay, what are the deciles of idiosyncratic returns in the data? And we're going to say that cryptos that are in the bottom at one point at, in one week of our sample in the bottom decile of the distribution are going to be shot. So that's going to give me um, every week a set of cryptos that may or may not be shocked and they they can change from week to week. Um, and then we're going to look at in that week where we observe the shock, which ones are the cryptos that are connected with that crypto in the news. So we're going to have a set of cryptos that are shocked, a set of cryptos that are peers according to our way of defining peers, and a set of cryptos that are neither peers nor linked. Uh, so these are the different uh, set of cryptos that we have. Um, in the paper, we also consider uh, here, I'm going to show you only results for kind of negative idiosyncratic return shocks. You do the same for positive idiosyncratic return shocks and for volatility shocks in the data. <coughs> in the paper, sorry. And we pretty much find the same thing. Um, so here, I'm just showing you kind of when we observe events and um, how many cryptos are generally shocked and how many are found to be peers. So not all cryptos experience shocks. So that's kind of a good thing. There are cryptos that are fine. And not all cryptos are peers. So there's some cryptos that are sometimes peers and some cryptos that are never peers. That is going to really allow us to identify the effect really due to being peer of one uh, shock uh, asset. <coughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to run regressions where we take the standardized idiosyncratic return of one crypto in a given week. And we're going to regress that on uh, an indicator of whether that crypto is either one of these shock cryptos or a link crypto while controlling for um, crypto fixed effects, industry time fixed effects, as well as kind of controls that may kind of relate to uh, these uh, idiosyncratic returns that we're trying to explain. Now, the parameters that we really care about are these gamma parameters because they tell us kind of the excess idiosyncratic return really duly, only due to being linked with one of these shock cryptos. Um, if these two parameters share the same sign, then that would point towards kind of a contagion effect. Both of these cryptos are moving in the, the, pri the returns of both of these cryptos are moving in the same direction. If they have the opposite sign, then that points towards a competition effect. Both of these cryptos are moving in opposite directions. And in the data, what we find is that during the event week, generally we observe very cleanly that these two parameters have opposite signs. Um, and they're also stati statistically significant. Um, so in term, uh, everything here that I measured is kind of in standardized uh, units just to be able to compare it across cryptos. Uh, but you can translate these kind of estimates to nominal measurements and it, they would indicate roughly that when one of these shock cryptos experiences a shock, their idiosyncratic returns are about 15% lower than implied by kind of these risk factors or these characteristics, uh, while the returns of peer cryptos are about 1.5% higher in that week. Uh, so we kind of try to figure out what's going on in these event weeks that's driving these, uh, these effects. Um, and what we find kind of across different ways of analyzing this data is that um, before, even before one of these shocks hits one of the shock cryptos, these cryptos are already experiencing some sort of kind of informational event. So there's a lot of like reporting about these shock cryptos in the news. There's a lot of Reddit activity about these shock cryptos. So there's something occurring with these cryptos. Once the, and there's also already trading uh, a, a, for these cryptos. So if you look at kind of the abnormal trading volume for these shock cryptos, it spikes already before the event week. Now, once the event hits, the news also starts picking up on how, or starts reporting about how these shock cryptos are connected to the, link crypt, to the peer cryptos in the sample. 
So you see that the number of mentions of these peer crypto spikes in the weeks, uh, in the event week, uh, in, the, in the paper, we also show that Reddit activity spikes also in the event week for the peer cryptos, but not for these non-peer cryptos. And ultimately, investors start to digest this information. So what we see is that the trading volume for peer cryptos also spikes in this event week. So we're all, what there seems to be is that there's kind of an information flow from these shock cryptos to these peer cryptos, but not to these non-peer cryptos. Um, so this is the, the first part, right? In the event week, these peer cryptos react to uh, information that, it, that is being disseminated. Then uh, if you kind of follow the literature on stocks, then a lot of these papers for equities argue that uh, these effects that we kind of establish here should be concentrated among smaller assets because those assets are the ones that have less investor attention. So investors, basically, it takes them a little bit longer to process this information. Um, so we kind of break up the set of peer cryptos according to whether these peers are smaller or larger than the uh, cryptos that they're being connected with in the news. And consistent with that, we indeed find that it's that the effect is kind of concentrated among these smaller assets. So there seems to be information that's flowing from cryptos that are shot to these smaller peer cryptos. And then ultimately, it takes, a, it takes investors time to process this information. If you kind of look at um, the cumulative returns of the different cryptos in the weeks after an event occurs, then of course these shock cryptos experience extremely negative returns during the event and then kind of co-move with the market or maybe a little bit worse on the market in the weeks after the event. Larger peer cryptos, they don't experience any abnormal performance. They just kind of co-move with the market. Investors don't seem to kind of be learning anything new about these um, larger peer cryptos. But if you look at kind of the smaller peer cryptos, they tend to experience kind of positive returns during the event week. And then that return really quickly, uh, or sorry, slowly kind of starts catching up with the market. So kind of investors start realizing this information was really not about anything that's uh, correct or fundamental about these uh, peer cryptos and eventually prices drop. So what we wanna do is we wanna see whether we can exploit kind of this predictability, right? Because now we know that if peer, smaller peer cryptos are mentioned in the news, then likely their returns are going to revert. Um, so we built kind of trading strategies that when we observe a shock, determine whether or not there were sh link cryptos in, the, in that week and whether those link cryptos are smaller or larger than these uh, uh, shock cryptos. And then we just short sell those, stock, uh, those cryptos. We're going to keep kind of the position open for several weeks. So this potentially could be really costly. Uh, but I'm going to show you kind of all the results based on kind of realistic uh, trading fees. So if I short sell one of these cryptos, I'm going to keep the crypto open for several weeks, which is going to be my holding period. And if I trade, I'm only going to invest a fraction of the wealth that I have, namely one over the number of weeks that I'm going to hold this position open. So that every week, kind of, I update this uh, portfolio depending on whether or not there are these shock cryptos. So what you find is that um, depend, depending on how long you want to keep the position open, uh, Eventually, after about eight weeks, kind of the whole effect of this predictability that arises kind of fades out. Um, so if you hold your position opens for eight weeks, you kind of generate portfolios that have high alphas, zero beta, and really high sharp ratios. Uh, so this is kind of consistent with uh, measurements that have also been established for equities. For example, Cohen and Frazzini have a paper in 2008 in the Journal of Finance that say, well, if you kind of were to build the same strategy with kind of customer supplier linkages, then you would also generate predictable returns that fade out over eight weeks roughly. Uh, so these are all kind of, this is consistent with those kind of findings. Now, what's surprising is that these trading strategies are really, really profitable. I mean, this is, a, if you analyze this, this is a 55% alpha and a sharp ratio of two, even after short selling fees. So this, I'm including a 1% per week short selling fee which is kind of what Kraken charges to, to open up margin positions. Um, so this is pretty profitable. Um, now, I don't necessarily want to say that, well, now you should just go and trade this because um, cryptocurrencies are hard to short sell. Not, you can't really short sell every cryptocurrency. Uh, but generally what this results show is that it's just 
because investors have limited attention constraints, it takes them time to process this information and that kind of leads to uh, predictable uh, returns even among the set of peer assets that, we, that we've established. So it doesn't need to be kind of a true contractual economic linkage underlying this. As long as investors perceive assets to be linked, that's already sufficient to have these kind of predictable um, effects. So overall, what we show here is that if, if you were able to kind of measure competition and contagion in a market that really only includes peer assets, then you would tend to find evidence that the competition effect outweighs the contagion effect. The effects tend to be concentrated among small peers with low investor attention, and that results in predictable returns. Uh, the way we establish these results is by looking at cryptocurrency markets that don't have any kind of customer supplier linkages or credit linkages. And we use kind of an NLP methodology to identify peers when they're co-mentioned in the news. No, let me get out of here. <laughs> 